All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Quiring, and I'm one of the research co-leads for Smart and Resilient Communities at Ohio State. And on behalf of the Sustainability Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's seminar on facilitating urban cooling technology innovation and adoption through living laboratory experiments. And that will be presented by Professor David Saylor, who is joining us today from Arizona State University. I'll provide a more detailed introduction for Professor Saylor in a moment, but first I'd like to cover some of the logistics for our meeting today. Uh, first, please keep your cameras off and your sound on mute for the entirety of the, the Zoom meeting today. Um, second, you're welcome to ask questions at any time during the presentation, and please uh, post your questions in the chat box and we'll be facilitating the Q&A at the end uh, after Prof Professor Saylor has completed his presentation. And third, um, this talk is being recorded, so I just want everyone to be aware that um, our presentation today will be recorded and it will be shared at a later date through the Sustainability Institute's YouTube channel so that it will be available for those who weren't able to join us today um, for the live presentation. This is the very first Smart and Resilient Communities Seminar, and therefore we have invited the faculty director, uh, Dr. Alina Irwin from the S Sustainability Institute. She's also a distinguished professor in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics to provide some words of welcome and a brief introduction to the ongoing activities at the Sustainability Institute. Professor Irwin. Professor Quiring, thank you very much. Um, and I am in, in very grateful to both Stephen as well as, as, well as uh, Gusha Akar, our two research leaders for the Smart and Resilient Communities uh, Research Program area. Um, the Sustainability Institute um, could not um, do what it does without the leadership of uh, some of our key faculty uh, of which two are uh, Stephen and Gusha. I also want to also thank um, our other research uh, faculty leaders uh, who are in two other areas of emphasis, sustainable energy uh, led by Jeff Balecki and Dave Cole, as well as uh, healthy air, land and water uh, led by uh, Jay Martin and Linda Weavers. So uh, I am the faculty director for the Sustainability Institute and along with Kate Barter, who is our executive director, uh, we together co-direct the Institute. Uh, the Institute uh, was launched in January of 2019, so just over two years ago. Um, and we have been going uh, uh, gangbusters um, uh, every day working towards our overall mission, which is to integrate sustainability and resilience scholarship and activities across the breadth of the university. And so that's in, in terms of supporting, facilitating, and sometimes leading research, uh, supporting and facilitating education and learning, uh, as well as doing a lot with uh, connecting and supporting campus sustainability uh, and partnerships with uh, many different kinds of external stakeholders, uh, as well as uh, a, a big goal of simply just trying to change the culture of sustainability here uh, at Ohio State in Ohio and across the world. We're not modest. Um, we also have a small but mighty staff who works every day uh, as, as hard as they can to advance this mission. And we are very grateful uh, for the support that uh, some of those staff have provided here today for the seminar. I don't wanna uh, take a lot of time. I just wanna uh, briefly also mention, um, we have a, a number of affiliated faculty who also make up a, a core part of the Institute. We have 31 core faculty who uh, we are joined at the hip with and uh, who are uh, faculty hired through the Discovery Themes Initiative here at Ohio State, uh, who are just fabulous and, and work across the board in many different uh, areas of sustainability and resilience. And we're grateful for all the work they do uh, in helping to advance our mission. We also have about 300 affiliated faculty, inclusive of those core faculty that uh, also are engaged in the Institute in a number of different ways. I just wanna mention a couple of different programs uh, in case, uh, for those of you who are here at Ohio State um, and you may not be aware of all that we do, um, we do offer a seed grant program to support interdisciplinary research for new research teams, particularly focused on junior scholars. 
Um, we also have research grants for students uh, as well. Uh, we support teaching initiatives and learning initiatives. Uh, for example, we have an endowment fund that supports new curriculum development. Um, and we uh, are doing other work to support student engagement and learning. For example, we uh, help to support and facilitate the sustained uh, student learning um, community on campus. Uh, we also do a lot, as I mentioned, to help support campus sustainability. Uh, we uh, facilitate the Ohio State Sustainability Fund and awarded about $1.8 million out of that fund over the last uh, year or so to support campus-based projects that often have uh, research as well as student learning uh, components to those. So those are just some of the ways uh, that we seek to uh, advance our mission. Uh, there are other ways in which we are uh, engaged and um, we uh, welcome um, uh, anyone else to join as an affiliated faculty or researcher. Um, and please check out our website, si.osu.edu, for a full list of events and engagements. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Stephen. Thanks so much, Alina. And we'll definitely highlight some of those opportunities again at the end so that after you get excited and inspired by Professor Saylor's talk, you can find ways to connect and get involved in uh, the sustainability work that's going on at Ohio State. So it's now my privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Professor David Saylor. Uh, David is a professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning and director of the Urban Climate Research Center. This research center has 36 faculty affiliates across seven, ASU, uh, seven schools at ASU. And the center is focused on developing and implementing large scale interdisciplinary projects to address crucial atmospheric environment challenges, especially focused on cities. Prior to joining ASU, Professor Saylor was on the faculties at Tulane University and Portland State University. He previously served as the director of the South Central Regional Center of the National Institute for Global Environmental Change at Tulane. And he was the founding director of the Green Building Research Laboratory at Portland State. Professor Saylor re received his doctorate in mechanical engineering from UC Berkeley, where he conducted research in collaboration with the Energy and Environment Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Professor Saylor's scholarly research focuses on the intersection of climate with the built environment. And this includes a focus on building energy consumption and renewable energy resources, as well as both indoor and outdoor thermal comfort and air quality. He has worked extensively on quantifying the causes and prospects for mitigating the urban heat island effect. He has published more than 150, uh, 115 journal articles in his career and his research has been funded by a large number of federal agencies such as NSF, EPA, NASA, ONR, DOE, and others. It is my distinct privilege to welcome Dr. Saylor to Ohio State University today, and he will be presenting uh, a talk entitled Facilitating Urban Cooling Technology Innovation and Adoption Through Living Laboratory Experiments. Professor Saylor, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Quaring, for that very nice introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Just a quick thumbs up that you can see my PowerPoint. Well, if I don't hear anything, I'll trust that it's good. So yeah, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak with you today. It was really uh, great to, to hear from Dr. Irwin about uh, the Sustainability Institute at, at Ohio State. And I think we have a lot of common interests. So hopefully we'll find a way to turn this into more of a discussion and perhaps long-term engagement. So my, my presentation today is focusing on a lot of the work that we're doing here in Phoenix around facilitating urban cooling technologies and strategies for uh, really uh, focused on cooling the city of Phoenix. Uh, and as you might know, just to give you a little bit of context, I think uh, your uh, high temperatures in the summer in, in uh, Columbus are, are on the order of 30 Celsius, uh, so what, high 80s Fahrenheit. Uh, just this past summer, the city of Phoenix had an entire month 
where our minimum nighttime temperatures were above 90 Fahrenheit and our maximum temperatures were above 110 Fahrenheit. So that, that gives you a sense of the challenge that we're dealing with here in, in Phoenix. And so let me just move on by uh, telling you a little bit about uh, the sort of the, the motivation for, for why we're doing this. You know, as I, as I said, cities are hot. And so if you look at any sort of uh, satellite remote sense uh, imagery of surface temperatures, this happens to be Boston. You can actually see uh, Logan Airport uh, sort of jetting out into the bay there. Um, let's see if I can put on my pointer here. There we go. So like, you know, you should be able to see Logan Airport. Um, in any case, you know, there's a very strong thermal signature of, of just about any city. Uh, and so with the surface temperatures being as hot as they are, you might expect that there are also air temperature uh, elevations that are uh, of, of interest and concern. So uh, if, you, if you zoom into any particular city, this happens to be Phoenix, uh, you start to see uh, the, the variation in this heat. So you see surfaces that are cool, uh, trees and grasses and lawns, and you see surfaces that are hot. Uh, the, the freshly uh, coated uh, paving here um, on the right-hand side of the image, the, some of the rooftops are, are quite hot. And what happens is these extremely hot surface temperatures give rise to elevations in air temperature. As the air flows over these surfaces, it picks up heat and it warms up. And so we're interested in a wide range of aspects of, of this, this uh, thermal challenge in cities from both surface temperatures to air temperatures and the environments that, that we live in. Um, so before getting into a discussion of of uh, how to deal with or how to address these, these challenges. I, I wanna just step back a bit and give you a little bit of an overview of the energy balance of a city in general. And uh, this will help point us towards possible solutions down the road. So first of all, the, the single largest input of energy to the city is from the sun. In Phoenix, during the uh, middle of the summer, midday, we'll have solar insulation levels of 1,000 to 1,100 watts per square meter. And so our first line of defense against that intense input of energy into the city is through the surfaces that that radiation hits. So our building surfaces, our ground level, and, and how these surfaces deal with that energy, specifically their, their solar reflectance or their ability to reflect that energy away from the city uh, is really one of our strongest opportunities to cool cities. Once that energy does get absorbed by surfaces, however, uh, it is oftentimes uh, trapped in urban canyons. So every surface is going to emit energy of its own as a function of its temperature. And depending upon the morphology of the city, how, how deep these canyons are, oftentimes that energy gets absorbed by these surfaces, gets trapped. And as, it, as these surfaces radiate, they can't really see the sky. And so they, they, they stay warm even into the evening hours. Uh, another mechanism that we have in cities for dealing with extreme heat is evapotranspiration or latent heat. So cities tend to have much less vegetation uh, than do the, the surrounding areas. Uh, Phoenix being in a desert is a little bit of an anomaly in that respect, but the presence of vegetation allows us to, to evaporatively cool cities. Um, another aspect of cities that's important to keep in mind, and this can contribute to uh, thinking about some of the possible solutions, is that we further elevate the, the thermal environment through the, the um, uh, anthropogenic waste heat that's emitted by buildings and by vehicles uh, in our urban settings. And so energy efficiency measure, measures might be another way of dealing with some of that excess heat. And then finally here on the bottom, uh, I have this, this, this uh, bullet point for thermal storage. And one of the things that's very evident in cities is that they're, they're very thermally massive. They have a very uh, high capacity to store heat during the day, the heat of the sun that comes in, and they release that heat over the nighttime hours. So oftentimes the, the effect of cities that we often hear referred to as the urban heat island effect tends to be largest in the nighttime hours. So before getting into any solutions, I wanna talk a little bit about why we care. 
And I ask this question uh, because we can't really hope to propose effective solutions unless we really understand the problems. And when it comes to trying to convince city and local governments to do anything about it, it helps to be able to quantify the, the relative importance of cooling the city. And so here um, I have a section that I'm going to call societal benefits of reducing urban temperatures. And the question that I pose at the bottom, I think is, is sort of a new way of thinking about it in more of a sort of a business-like uh, return on investment type uh, framing, which is what is the value of reducing air temperatures by one degree Celsius? And I, I asked this question, recognizing that whatever the answer is, we can scale and ask the same question of, well, what if we could only cool the air temperature by a 10th of a degree C? Would, what would that benefit look like? And so uh, before getting to the details of that, let's think about what aspects of society are, are adversely affected by excess heat in cities. And so when I think about excess heat, I'm thinking about not just air temperatures, but also surface temperatures, and also the radiative environments that uh, pedestrians and individuals are exposed to. So think about shade, for example. Um, these are all important and they're important for different reasons. And it's, it's important that we keep in mind that there are these, these multiple sort of co-benefits of cooling a city that need to be taken as, as, a, as a complete package, if you will. So energy and water use are impacted by the thermal environment, as is air quality, sustainability of green infrastructure, and outdoor thermal comfort for pedestrians. So these are all things that we, we care about in the urban, urban setting. And I've started to try to put you know, a, a value to it, if you will. So in terms of just looking at energy demand, we did an analysis in the Phoenix metro area where we, we recognize that air conditioning energy consumption is sensitive to um, uh, ambient air temperatures roughly at about 5% per degree Celsius in the summertime. And so we used uh, a suite of building simulation models that modeled whole, whole buildings, sort of the, the representative building stock for at least for the residential sector in, in the Phoenix area. And we found that if you could simply reduce the air temperatures in the Maricopa County area by one degree Celsius, you could save residential ratepayers $30 million per year in avoided air conditioning costs. And there's the same order of magnitude benefit for the commercial sector as well. One thing that we have to keep in mind, and this is something that's particularly important, I think, for you at Ohio State, is that wherever you have summertime benefits, you run the risk of wintertime penalties. So specifically, there's this, this effect known as the heating penalty in winter. Anytime you cool a city, you run the risk of while you're reducing air conditioning energy use in summer, you're actually increasing heating demand in winter. And so cities in the US Midwest see maybe a factor of five or 10 more heating degree days per year. That's a sort of a um, marker of, of demand for heating than they do cooling degree days. So if you look at the, the utility load versus temperature profiles for hot climate cities like Phoenix versus cold climate cities, uh, like what you might be exposed, exposed to uh, in the Midwest, um, the, the wintertime penalty is something that you might need to be considered, uh, uh, concerned with. Uh, but this penalty is decreasing in, in time. So if you look at just the US population weighted degree days from 1990 to 2050, you see a, a steady decline in the in the measured degree days and then the projected degree days continue to decline. So what this means is that the heating penalty is going to become less and less of an issue. The cooling benefit of cooling cities, the air conditioning benefit is going to continue to become even more substantial. So let's talk just briefly about water. Uh, much of the data that I'm going to present are specific to the Phoenix metro area, uh, but there are analogs for other cities, of course. So. Um, we've done some research with colleagues that have shown that residential water use decreases by about three to 5% if you can simply reduce the air temperature by one degree Celsius. And so that has value in terms of, well, especially in a, a water strapped climate like the desert Southwest, um, but also in terms of the energy costs for, for, uh, for um, refining and, and, and pumping water. Um, there is, however, uh, a possible adverse effect that we need to think about when we think about cooling cities with respect to water, 
And I do have a colleague who has recently done a, a or not recently, a few years back now, uh, did a study where he looked at what might be the effect if we cool Phoenix on precipitation events. And so he did a, a regional scale, mesoscale atmospheric model simulation for, for the Phoenix metro area encompassing the entire state of Arizona. And he actually found that if we reduce air temperatures in Phoenix through some of these strategies I'm going to be talking about, you might actually reduce precipitation. Now, when you look at the reduction in precipitation that's projected by his models in comparison with the reduction of water use, uh, we find that on balance, it's still benefit, beneficial to cool city in terms of its impacts on water use. Uh, air quality is a little bit more complicated. Uh, if you look at plots of photochemical uh, smog or ozone as a function of temperature, um, you'll see a very strong correlation. And some of that is causal, but some of it is just a uh, correlation. Uh, some of the highest temperature events tend to be associated with high pressure events, which are also associated with low winds and low mixing. So you have a, a concentration of ozone due to that. But as you increase um, temperature, biogenic and anthropogenic emissions increase. So by cooling the city, we can reduce those emissions. Uh, also, some of the rate constants for some of the reactions that involve the production and, and destruction of ozone uh, are temperature dependent. So there's a, a complex mix of effects, but generally it's, it's uh, believed that if we can increase, or sorry, decrease the air temperatures in a city, we should also be able to clean the air. So I wanna transition now to talking about people and, and thermal environments that they're exposed to. So first of all, the concept of thermal comfort is one where the strict definition is that it's the condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment. So it's a somewhat subjective measure, but the, there are a number of, of key environmental factors that go into that, that uh, condition of mind, specifically the exposure of the human body to direct radiation from the sun is a large contributor to how comfortable you feel, uh, but also the ability for the body to, to release heat either through respiration, through evaporation, or through convective exchange with the environment. All of those are factors that, that play a role in thermal comfort. From the perspective of some of the technologies I'm going to talk about, we're going to focus more on how those, those technologies affect the incoming shortwave radiation, as well as the reflected radiation, and the net long wave energy balance that the pedestrian feels. So getting back to sort of this quantification of the benefits of cooling a city by one degree, let's talk a little bit about human health. Uh, in Maricopa County, which is the county in which Phoenix and Arizona State sits, um, heat causes more than 2,800 emergency department visits every year, 685 plus hospitalizations, and more than 150 deaths. And so if you think about, um, you know, I, I hate to put a price on the human life, but the US government does. So the US EPA, for example, says that the statistical value of life is about $10 million. And the epidemiological models that are out there suggest that if we could reduce ambient air temperatures by one degree Celsius, we could reduce morbidity and mortality uh, by more than 5%. So that's something like seven or eight lives per year in Maricopa County that could be saved just by cooling the city by one degree. So that gives you a sense of some of the key factors. And if, if you think about it, adding together some of those values, the value of, of cooling the Phoenix metro area by one degree Celsius would be something like $100, $150 million per year. And that doesn't even consider the economic and tax base implications that are related to temperature impacts on tourism. Uh, in Phoenix, we have this uh, effect called the snowbirds, people that come to the warm climates in the, in the winter months to, to avoid sort of the, the winter in Northern US and Canada and Alaska. Um, and so if, if those snowbirds come for, for a shorter period of time, or if they choose to, to go elsewhere in, in their winters, uh, it could significantly impact uh, the economic tax base for the state. So there's, there's a lot of value there. And, and when we think about convincing governments to, to act and to, to spend taxpayer money, uh, being able to, to speak to them about 
the value in terms of avoided air conditioning costs and so forth, uh, I think actually resonates with them as they try to make decisions. So again, I want to return to this, this figure, because if you recall, I, I talked about the strategies that we're going to focus on are ones that deal with the shortwave radiation and the longwave radiation. Now, I do I think that Ohio State has some initiatives around, around tree planting, and there's a lot of, lot of work in the Phoenix metro area going on with, with urban forestry as well. Uh, but the, the few technologies that I'm going to talk about today will focus really on more radiation balances. So to start with, uh, let's look at paving. So a typical city is covered by about 30% of the surface area is paving. Obviously, that's highly variable from one city to the next, but it's an order of magnitude that, that matters. Uh, conventional asphalt, when we pave our, our streets or our parking lots, uh, starts out with a very low solar reflectance. Maybe it reflects five to 8% of the energy of the sun. The rest of it, it absorbs. Uh, as paving ages though, uh, some of the aggregate starts to show more and that the, the solar reflectance actually increases, which is a good thing. And maybe it gets up to around 12 or 15%. Uh, however, uh, due to uh, maintenance requirements, we have to routinely and continuously resurface our asphalt streets. So every three to six years, and it change, it's different for different, different cities, different climates, but we typically have to re-coat or reseal our asphalt streets. And that restores it to its initial very dark color, very hot surface. So some of the paving innovations that we've been talking about with, with our colleagues, both on the research front, but also in terms of our local government uh, uh, collaborators and stakeholders, are first of all, uh, high solar reflectance asphalt sealants. So rather than recoating a parking lot with a very dark asphalt-based product, there are asphalt-based products that have uh, some of the same uh, sort of structural benefits of asphalt and longevity that, that have been engineered to have a much higher reflectance. So on the left is a traditional sealant for an asphalt parking lot on the right, is actually something that was, was paved earlier this summer in Phoenix you know, with a cool seal product. So um, there are other strategies that I've got colleagues working on that deal with more of the, the thermal storage and heat capacity aspects of paving. So I have one colleague who's doing work with aerogel enhanced paving that has a very low thermal conductivity. So it doesn't, doesn't conduct that heat in, into and store it in in the paving, rather it stays near the surface and gets rid of it rather quickly, which is very useful for nighttime cooling in Phoenix. Um, on the roofing front, there are also a number of, of important um, uh, characteristics of roofing in terms of the ability to, to cool the city. Roof surfaces, again, there's a high variability. They're typically 20 to 25% of the urban area. Uh, Rooftops tend to have a much wider range of solar reflectances, anywhere from 10% to 80% with relatively high uh, thermal emissivities, around 0.9. Um, but roofs do heat up during the day quite a bit. Uh, and oftentimes they'll cool off rapidly at night due to the fact that they have a high sky view factor. Uh, and they also tend to have a very low heat capacity. So you might have, this is a, a picture on the lower left here of a large shopping mall in Phoenix that has a very dark roof. Uh, it's a membrane roof on top of insulation. And so the heat has nowhere to go. So the roof absorbs all the energy during the day. It gets really, really hot, uh, over 65, 70 degrees Celsius. And of course, as the air flows over that surface, it convects that heat into the city. So some of the innovations in roof surfaces that we've been exploring are everything from very simple conventional just high reflectance coatings and, and roof materials. So, you know, any commercial roof can very easily have a, a white membrane roof or a black membrane roof. And in most locations, the white membrane roof is advantageous both from the, the uh, energy performance of the building, the performance in terms of, of reducing waste heat or uh, sorry, sensible heat into the environment, but also longevity of the roof because it undergoes less thermal cycling. Uh, so there are very, you know, tr tried and true simple technologies, but 
Uh, in the residential roofing market, there was a bit of a reluctance to go with some of the higher reflectance coatings. This is actually my old neighborhood in New Orleans, uh, a white roof right next to a black roof. And um, due to some of the, the sort of perception issues of, of residents, uh, no one wants to be the only white roof in their block. Uh, also, uh, sometimes white roofs show dirt more and, and some of the things that grow on roofs in New Orleans. And so the industry, recognizing the opportunity and the challenge, actually started to, developing, to develop these uh, selective solar reflectance products that can have a dark look uh, but this roof might have a solar reflectance of four or 5%. You can engineer a, a roof that'll have the exact same visible look because in the visible spectrum, it's got the same reflective properties, but it can reflect more than 40% of the energy of the sun. So there's a lot of interesting uh, technologies that have developed around that. That's this middle uh, diagram here. And then something that we're very interested in that we've been working a lot on lately is this concept that's referred to as passive daytime radiative cooling or PDRC. And so this is a, a relatively new technology that uh, develops surfaces and coatings that have an extremely high reflectance to solar energy. So very high solar reflectance or albedo, but also an ultra high thermal emittance. So what that means is that they actually, they emit radiation based on their temperature very efficiently. And, and so these surfaces, uh, for the vast majority of the time, in fact, um, in, in many implementations, 100% of the time are cooler than the air surrounding them. And so if you think about what that means, if you can create a surface that's always cooler than the air, you have a surface that's acting as what I call a radiative heat pump. It takes heat out of the air as, as the warm air flows over the, the cool surface, and then it radiates it out to space through the atmospheric window. So there's some really interesting technologies here uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail. But um, it's one thing to develop these technologies in a lab. It's one, one thing to model them on the computer, which we've done a lot of, uh, to get them in the field. And that's really the, the focus of this talk. That's where we run into the barriers. So, so first of all, there are first cost barriers related to implementing these technologies. A lot of them are newer. A lot of them are more expensive just because they don't have the market share necessary to get them uh, down in price to be com cost competitive. Um, they also are not perfect. You know, so technologies, you know, as we develop them, have limitations. And it's only through sort of going through the R&D cycle several times that you actually get to the point where the technology is both, co both cost effective because of market penetration, but also highly efficient because we've identified and, and fixed all the problems. Um, and there are also, of course, uncertainties about side effects the, or the unintended consequences of some of these technologies. And I'm going to dig into those in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you think about your typical uh, streets department uh, manager in a city, uh, there's a certain inertia to, to changing your decision making processes. Someone who's been paving with a traditional uh, dark uh, paving, you know, asphalt seal for decades is not readily going to accept a new technology that may or may not work better, right? They, they'll, they'll just take the trusted and true approach. So we need to find a way to break down some of these barriers. And the strategy that we've taken is to partner with cities to develop relationships which do take time to develop, and then to pr 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 promote and propose to them pilot projects that allow us to do experimental investigation where we can quantify the pros and cons of these different technologies. So that's where this, this whole talk brings us is this notion of using the city as a living laboratory and the challenges that we run into as, as we try to, to, to use that model. So going back to some of the, the cool paving technologies that we talked about, um, let me get into some of the specific example projects that we've, we've been exploring. Uh, but before I get into that, just a, a sort of a summary or a recap of the pros and cons that we need to be uh, taking into account as we try to evaluate these technologies. So the, the pros of cool paving, well, if you can have a street that has a lower surface temperature, uh, it will also result in lower air temperatures above that surface. Uh, it'll improve the lifespan of the paving by having less thermal cycling. 
And you know, there's some side effects that are oftentimes not thought about initially, like, well, you, you'll actually have improved visibility at night. You can either reduce the amount of lighting that you need for a neighborhood, or you can have better safety for pedestrians, uh, for crime, and for, for vehicles by simply having the, the street lights reflected uh, better by the surface. And you've all probably noticed this if, you're, if you've driven over an asphalt versus a concrete road um, at the same time of night. Uh, of course, some of the cons or the, the downsides of having some of these higher reflectance uh, paving products is that first of all, paving is oftentimes shaded, whether it's shaded by cars or trees or buildings, the, the relative ability to take advantage of that, that cooling benefit depends upon uh, how much uh, exposure that, that paved surface has to the sun. The other uh, thing that has actually been a really big a challenge for some of these cool paving products is the reflected shortwave radiation or glare that that uh, that it gives to both the drivers but also also to pedestrians. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, lifespan. Um, if if we go with some of the different technologies, some of the, some of the acrylic based products for coating roads, there's some real concerns about lifespan. Uh, traction. If you talk with any bicyclists or motorcyclists or if you're one yourself, you know that when you go down a road and you drive, just going onto, the, onto that, that, uh, that uh, lane marking strip, stripe that's got less, uh, less traction, I mean, you, you, you notice that and it actually becomes a potential uh, danger to, you know, to two-wheel traffic. So there's those sorts of issues. And then of course, there's just general public acceptance, you know, changing your, your neighborhood street from, um, from dark black to not white, but more of a kind of a gray, sort of a, an a, a concrete color. So one of the first projects that we investigated was with the uh, Maricopa County. So uh, this is a parking lot directly across from the county uh, courthouse building. And because of a longstanding relationship with them, we were able to convince them not only to deploy cool paving, but to do it in an experimental fashion. You've got a large parking lot, only put the cool paving on half of it. And that's one of the challenges that you often have dealing with, with you know, local governments, and, or I've had the same, same issue, you know, working with like Walmart, where they were going to put a, a green roof on a, a, on a large Walmart in Portland, Oregon, um, where we wanted to turn that into a research experiment. And it takes, it takes a lot of conversation with them to, to get them to go halfway to say, yes, we're, we're willing to try this new technology and we're willing to recognize that, that, that part of this is gonna be a control, part of this is gonna be a test. And so this is a you know, Maricopa County parking lot. Uh, the right-hand side here, you can see this is a, a helicopter infrared image. My student was hanging out of the, the uh, side of the helicopter, got this nice image of the parking lot. And what you see, is a very strong temp temperature, surface temperature signal. So the surface temperature of the cool side of this parking lot was about nine degrees Celsius cooler than the conventional parking lot. And of course, we know that that's going to translate into an air temperature effect. The question really is, can we capture that? Can we measure it? And the answer is eh, maybe no. And that's, that's one of the other big challenges. We know that there's an air cooling effect, but it's largely dissipated horizontally and vertically as the air flows over the parking lot. So it does benefit the city, but can we actually measure a, a discernible signal at the site? Well, we had flux towers set up in both parking lots. That's this picture on the lower right-hand side. And we were not able to measure at two meters any, any temperature difference. And part of that's because much of the temperature difference is, is sort of, uh, going to have a larger magnitude signal near the surface and it starts to diffuse as, as you go away from the surface. This is just a picture of that same instrument in the parking lot. So um, this work we, we did with the, the county was about at the same time we, that a project with the city of Phoenix was coming to fruition. So the history of this project, this, this uh, Phoenix Cool Paving Partnership, goes back about well, two summers when um, the city of Los Angeles had done a, a pilot project in 10 of their council districts looking at cool paving 
And they didn't have a designed experiment. They were just, you know, they, they took some ad hoc measurements kind of before and after, but they didn't really have any sort of designed experiment. Um, it was more, in, in my mind, it was more for show um, than for research. And so uh, we actually had an opportunity. Uh, I went to Los Angeles with the sustainability manager for the city of Phoenix. And that sort of goes to show some of the, the depth of our connections with the city of Phoenix. Uh, they were actually invited to be part of a, a uh, sustainability directors network meeting in Los Angeles where they were going to highlight some of LA's technologies. And they were asked to bring, you know, so every sustainability manager was asked to bring another city official who would have, you know, some interest in this, like some from the transportation department or something. Uh, city of Phoenix chose to, to look to ASU because we have longstanding partnerships. They said they are, they are our research arm. So, so I went with Mark Hartman from the city of Phoenix uh, to Los Angeles. We saw some of their technologies. We, we left there with the idea, let's do a, a paving project in Phoenix, but let's, let's turn it into an experiment. And so the city of Phoenix decided to do eight neighborhoods, which amounted to 36 miles of residential roads. They were already slated for resurfacing. As you recall, uh, roads have to re be resurfaced every three to five years anyway. Uh, so the idea was, well, let's just resurface them with a, a cool seal product instead of a conventional dark seal. And the key to the success of this project is that we got in at the ground floor in terms of designing the experiments and partnering with them to make substantial measurements. And so um, these are the, uh, the eight, uh, eight different neighborhoods in, in Phoenix metro area. Some of them tend to be uh, neighborhoods that, that are uh, poor neighborhoods like Maryvale here. And so there's also with a lot of these opportunities to partner with cities, there's infrastructure projects that allow us to, to look at the intersection of say environmental justice and this more general urban cooling uh, research. So some of the work that we did with the city of Phoenix was through field work campaigns where we had intensive single day campaigns uh, in, in one neighborhood, or actually in three different neighborhoods, we did uh, data where we, collect, we collected data four times a day. So at 5 a.m., we were out there putting together instruments, making measurements, um, and uh, we were collecting that data from August through September uh, for both the test neighborhood, but also for a nearby control neighborhood. Um, we used a mobile biometeorological platform to measure air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and net radiation, mean radiant uh, temperature uh, that pedestrians would feel either in the street or on the sidewalk. And then we also had vehicle traverses uh, where we, we drove the neighborhood with GPS logging um, sensors for air temperature at two meter height. Uh, we also gathered infrared thermometer data from, from the asphalt surface in front of the car. Uh, we also did helicopter overflights. We did three helicopter overflights uh, between August and October, gathering infrared imagery so we could also have sort of broad scale surface temperature data. This is just one of the car traverse instruments. This is a uh, just a map of the Maryville neighborhood showing the tra car transects that we did. We did each of these transects twice and half of this neighborhood was uncoded and half was coded. So we, we had a control and a test. Uh, we also had long-term measurements going on. So we actually bored holes in the asphalt and, and buried sensors. And so we've got diurnal profiles of, of subsurface temperatures as well as surface temperatures, as well as air temperatures. Uh, we're also doing monthly spectral radiative measurements with a portable spectrometer to look at the effects of aging of that paving. Um, you know, how is the solar reflectance changing in time? So this actually is just a, a few satellite, uh, sorry, sorry, helicopter pictures of one of the neighborhoods. This is in Anthem on the north side of Phoenix. And you can see in the middle here, they were only halfway done paving the streets. This is a, a nice sort of visual image that shows you um, on the left-hand side, this green is the, the, the cooler paved surface with a cool seal. The right hand is the older surface. And so what you see again is a surface temperature reduction of seven and a half degrees Celsius. And this was on a relatively moderately cool day, only 32 Celsius, 90 Fahrenheit. Um, and one thing I wanna sort of bring home is that our control and test measurements are for an, an aged street compared with a new cool seal street. And in fact, 
the true comparison should be between a new cool seal street and a new dark seal street, because that's exactly the option that you have at the time of, of resealing. And so this last set of pictures here shows, uh, this is the same picture from earlier in the slide talk, where you see these darker streets. Those were the ones that were freshly sealed. They are another five degrees hotter than just your traditional aged asphalt. So it, it's important to kind of keep that in mind as we compare their effects. But again, in terms of the air temperature measurements, we're finding less than half a degree Celsius cooling in neighborhood air temperatures. And so that is one of the challenges that we have in sort of telling the story of the urban cooling effect of these, these streets. We know they're cooling the surfaces. We therefore know that we're cooling the air. We just have a hard time capturing that cooling effect because it's diffused so readily through the, through the neighborhood and vertically. Um, so this is just a little um, side note about some of the uh, public perception issues of some of these technologies. I know I have a lot of slides to go forward through not much time. So I'm gonna go through the rest of this a little bit more quickly, but um, so the, the public perception uh, is off, often driven by incomplete information or analysis. So one thing that was one of our biggest downsides in this, this streets project was that um, one of my colleagues went there with her instrument and measured net radiant temperature. And she, and she found that, hey, if you're a pedestrian walking in the middle of the street at noon, which is not a, day, not a safe thing, as so I would recommend against it, your body will actually feel more net radiation on it on the white surface because of the, the reflected shortwave radiation than it would if you're walking above the black surface. And so the upshot there was, was well, you, want, you might actually feel cooler if you're walking down the middle of the street if it's a darker surface. The problem with that is that the rest of the day, you know, in the e evening hours, the white surface is far superior because it starts out cooler. And so you're in a much more uh, uh, thermally conducive environment for much of the day. And, and you all, you've also cooled the city. So one of the problems that we ran into was that, that um, despite our best efforts to clarify what was going on, the newspapers, this is um, a, an article that was published by the City Lab, um, actually the day of our meeting in Los Angeles, um, you know, they showed that, uh, you know, that cool pavements have some possible downside. And that then got translated to other uh, media venues and got worse and worse with every time it got re republished. And so it's, it's a cautionary tale about sharing data and sharing information with the media and making sure that they tell the whole story. So I'm gonna just really quickly blast through some of the cool roofing uh, pros and cons. Again, some of the same ideas, cool roofs uh, reduce surface temperatures, which reduces air temperatures, which reduces air conditioning demand for the, for the buildings on top of them. The problem is that the cool roofs are at an elevation. And if they're not the tallest building around, then they possibly reflect radiation into other buildings. So I'm going to skip some of this, the science here, but the, the upshot of these few sl slides is that, that we had done a lot of modeling that clearly showed the benefits of some of these high tech concepts like passive daytime radiative cooling materials where the surface uh, was, uh, was indeed cooler than the air temperature at all hours of the day. We, we put that into models of buildings and we found, and this is probably one of the more important slides and, and maps here, is that this is just a frequency diagram of the temperature elevation of the roof surface above ambient air temperature. The gray is your tr traditional roof. The traditional roof is oftentimes 30, 40 degrees Celsius hotter than air. If you put on a traditional white roof, um, you might be only you know, 5, 10, 15 degrees hotter than air. So white roofs are still hotter than air during much of the time. At night, they're a little cooler than air temperature. But if you put on a passive daytime radiative cooling roof, very high reflectance, but also very high emittance, that roof surface was always below ambient air temperature. So this has huge implications for saving energy in buildings and also for reducing the amount of of uh, sensible heat flux into the environment, so the urban heat island effect. In fact, your, your traditional roof puts a lot of heat into the environment. A white roof still puts some heat. A cool or super cool roof, the you know, passive daytime rate of the cooling roof in blue here, is always cooler than air. So it's always taking heat out of the air and, sh and shipping it off into space. And so let me um, 
talk a little bit about how we, we took that, those results and we partnered with the city of Tempe and with 3M uh, and with some internal funding here at ASU to do a pilot project on bus shelters in Tempe where we were going to deploy this kind of passive radiative cooling technology and measure its effects. Now, obviously just putting this on three bus shelters is not gonna cool the city, but we can get some useful information from those bus shelters that we can then um, propagate into a bigger story of how, or of what the potential is to cool the city. So we took three control shelters, three, three test shelters. Uh, so two were facing south, two were facing east, two were facing west. And we modified the surface of three of those shelters with the passive daytime rate of the cooling concept. Um, and so this is a, an image you can see, it looks kind of like a mirror-like surface, frankly, this is the 3M product. Uh, we installed sensors in the shelters um, and what we have found, and we've only got data from this winter because we started this late in the summer. And so we only have measurements from December really. And what we found was a very clear signal of surface temperatures that were 20 degrees cooler uh, than, uh, than the conventional roofing. So a huge potential to cool surfaces. And when you cool these surfaces that are elevated above the ground and have, have two sides to them, the air that flows past them uh, is able to dissipate its heat more readily to those surfaces, which then radiate it out to space. So some very promising early results but anytime you're talking about reflective surfaces in the city, there are concerns. And there, you know, this is a real building actually in London. Uh, part of the problem was that it's glazed you know, very heavily. Part of the problem is that it's concave and it actually melts cars parked across the street. So uh, images like this come to mind when people start thinking about very high, highly reflective surfaces. So we need, we need to move forward cautiously with, with pilot projects and be willing to remove those pilot projects if in fact they turn out to have significant adverse effects. So I'm just gonna conclude with some lessons learned. Um, and so, so basically for us, stakeholder engagement is key, building long-term relationships with, with our local governments, uh, with industry, so that they are going to be willing to let us in on the ground floor of opportunities to do experiments because you can't really do effective experiments on, on some of these, these projects, unless you can do before measurements and after, after measurements. So that's, that's one of the lessons learned. Um, another learn, uh, learned lesson is, you know, again, related to the long-term planning, we need to know about some of these opportunities ahead of time. One of our, our only partially successful examples with the city of Phoenix is where they got a $30 million HUD grant to redevelop a, a affordable housing neighborhood, the largest in the city, and they allowed us to get in on the design process, but it was really too late to have an effect on the actual design. So uh, we were doing neighborhood scale atmospheric model measurements of different techniques, different strategies for cooling the neighborhood. But by the time we had results, it was too late to inform the design process. So long-term planning and getting in early is important. And then finally communications, and I'm happy to talk more about some of the, the communication perils with, with the media. But again, all of these technologies tend to have an upside and a downside. And, and the media kind of likes to focus on the downside. So we need to make sure that we, we find a way to really broadcast the, the total picture so that, so that we get an honest assessment of what's, what's happening with these technologies. And so I will end it there and here my email for anyone who wants to contact me directly. And then our Twitter handle, uh, AS Urban Climate, uh, is a good place if you want to be updated on some of our work. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, um, thank you, Professor Saylor. Um, okay, so um, thank you. This was a very informative and engaging talk. So um, if you are here, you would hear some applause, but uh, that will be just me for now. Um, so at this point, we will move on to our discussants and we're going to hear from them. And then we're going to have a Q&A session again with Professor Saylor. So um, our discussants will be um, Harvey Miller, Professor Harvey Miller and Jason Servanek. And before I introduce our discussants, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask our audience to continue putting their questions in the chat box. 
we'll try to cover as many as we can based on um, our timing. Our first discussant is Professor Harvey Miller. Harvey is the Bob and Mary Roche Chair in Geographic Information Science. He is also the Director of the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, and he's a professor in the Department of Geography. He is also a member of the Faculty Advisory Board of the Sustainability Institute. His research focuses on geospatial and mobility data to support sustainable mobility for equitable and healthy cities. As the director of CURA, Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, Harvey works closely with community partners in the central Ohio region. Our second discussant will be Jason Servenick, and Jason is the Education and Outreach Director for the Bird, Polar, and Climate Research Center at The Ohio State University. Jason currently has four NSF-funded projects, and he led the development of the Columbus Climate Adaptation Plan. The most common request uh, that he receives as the Education and Outreach Director of the Center um, is on climate change. So with this, I will um, leave the uh, stage to Harvey first. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to comment on this really wonderful talk. It was very nice, David. Um, it was research-based also a master class in urban cooling challenges and approaches. So I, I really appreciate what you've shown us here today. I wanna to address two parts. I wanna, two things really. I wanna address, first of all, the, the domain you're working in, which is urban cooling. And then I also wanna talk about the approach you're taking, which are these community you, you, and university partnerships and also working in um, experimentation in the urban environment, which I think is very important. So urban cooling, this is not just a Phoenix thing. It's gonna be something here in Columbus and almost in every uh, city in North America. Um, Columbus is facing two major threats from climate, from the climate crisis. One is flooding due to extreme storms and, and heat stress. With respect to flooding, um, I'll just point out that it happened in 19, 1913. Look up the Franklinton flood if you don't believe me it's more likely to happen in the future. So this is something we're gonna to have to deal with, but we're also facing a heat stress problem that's going to affect both infrastructure and people in many American cities. With respect to infrastructure, the engineering tolerances by which we build transportation and other infrastructure is based on a recent climate history that no longer exists. So with increasing heat loads in the future, we may see our bridges and pavements buckling, our rain, rail lines deforming, commercial aviation curtailed. This may be the future we're dealing with because we've engineered these systems based upon climate parameters that are basically out the window at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's happening already. For a vivid example was in July 2012 when a U.S. Airways flight from National Airport in DC was delayed because its wheels got stuck in the heat softened tarmac. Some of you may, may remember this. The, the 35 passengers and three crew members on the plane had to get off to reduce the weight so they could actually move the plane across the heat softened tarmac. During the same heat wave, three Metro cars for the DC uh, Metro system derailed due, due to a heat kink as they called it in the tracks. So this is gonna be an important issue for, for infrastructure in the future. It's also gonna be very important for people. This is dangerous for people as David pointed out. And here we're seeing a tension with creating more sustainability, more sustainable mobility systems in our cities and also dealing with, the, with, the, with, with this problem. A more sustainable urban mobility system is one where we have a dense compact city where, mo where people walk, bike and use public transit for most trips. However, a denser built environment in, hotter, in a hotter climate makes it more difficult for people to use active and public transportation. So we have to densify and cool our cities at the same time. And this is really challenging. Uh, when it comes to walking, biking and transit, we, we have to not only invest green infrastructure, but also uh, not only gray infrastructure, but also green infrastructure. We need not just better sidewalks, bike bike lanes, bus stops, but also trees and shading to make that infrastructure more usable and comfortable during heat events. And a bonus is that a lot of the shading, you know, urban trees and so forth, also filter traffic emissions and improve air quality for nearby residents and, and slow cars. So these are the type of interventions that we want to, we want to make in our cities as we're trying to reach, you know, achieve a more sustainable um, urban environments. And I also wanna move on now to um, the university community partnerships and collaborations that David described, because these are essential. 
Many of the societal issues we deal with are so-called wicked problems. These are multidimensional and involve trade-offs that not everyone will agree with. And because of this, we have to be more engaged in our communities as we try to solve these crucial societal problems. We usually think of, of um, wicked problems as things such as equity, sustainability, conservation, but even small problems can be wicked as, as David demonstrated uh, when it comes to whether or not things will be accepted. If you don't think that small problems can be wicked, can have difficult trade-offs without, without easy solutions, just attend a, a public hearing on a proposed project in your community or your local neighborhood association meeting, you'll see exactly what, a, what, I, what I'm talking about. And the other ch challenges that David mentioned are also ring true, the inertia and fear of change we have in many communities and especially unintended consequences. That's a biggie. Cities are complex adaptive systems that are difficult to predict and can respond disproportionately to interventions. And we can see examples of this almost every, every US city. I mean, the interstate highway system is an example of a grand experiment that really went, went wrong, if we want to call it an experiment. Let's just call it a grand intervention that had some benefits, but a lot of unintended consequences we're still, still dealing with decades later. So what we're seeing right now, and David's research is really a good example of this, is the rise of urban experimentation, starting with small scale, local, and perhaps temporary interventions, evaluate the results, refine them, and iterate towards better solutions. You know, for the software engineers out there, it's a lot like agile development for cities, iterating towards better solutions, doing a lot of testing and refining. This is easy to do now because it's much easier to collect and analyze urban data, including sensor data, and found data that are byproducts of human activities. And this is leading to new forms of what I'd like to call opportunistic science. Science in the real world that leverage opportunities for natural and quasi experiments. Now, in order to do this, we have to build these collaborations and partnerships, and that can be very challenging. As David described there's so well, there's a large upfront investment that must occur. There must be a lot of time spent working on building relationships and this payoff may not be immediate. You need to play the long game, but you also need to be sensitive as to when it's working and when it's not. I was once at an event a few years ago at, for the TDAI uh, Translational Data Analytics Institute here at Ohio State. I remember IS Hyder was talking about uh, interdisciplinary collaborations. And he said, collaboration's a lot like dating. It takes a lot of time and you have to know when to move on. Uh, and that's true. You have to invest the time, but you have to know when it's, gonna, when it's working and when it's not working. Um, and a lot of times it really can work. Here at Cura, we, here at Ohio State and Cura, we work with community partners such as the City of Columbus, the Central Ohio Transit Authority, and our local metropolitan planning organization, MORPSI. Uh, and a lot of our time, our interactions are informal and ad hoc. You know, a lot of times we're not, we're not maybe actively collaborating all the time, but we keep the lines of communication open and active. We're constantly trying to, to, to exchange knowledge and information. And that's so when issues or opportunities come up, we're ready. The relationships understanding are there. Sometimes these opportunities are, are driven by us, like an NSF program comes along that we want to apply for at the university. Sometimes it's driven by uh, the community. For example, in Columbus, we're pursuing a new Vision Zero initiative to reduce road trauma. And we're also developing a new initiative in transit-oriented development. And our community partners can also pursue their own funding with our collaboration. So, there, so these opportunities can come from many different angles. And the important point is to have the relationships there and be ready. Be ready, so you're always ready when these opportunities or challenges come along. And just to finish up, I think a, a key message at the end of the talk was code development. These partnerships are not simply trading letters of support for grant opportunities while mostly engaging in parallel play. True partnerships occur when you can identify win-win situations. These are issues and opportunities where all partners benefit. And this requires a shared vision, commitment, and trust. And these are things that don't happen overnight. So um, thank you for your talk, David. I really appreciate some of the work you're doing there. And um, it, it really is a, a a good illustration of, of how to work in the community and try to try to work with for solutions that we can refine to uh, better outcomes. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, this was great. This was a great discussion. And uh, let's hear from Jason now. Okay. So I wanted to mention a few things that are going on at the local level, both in the city of Columbus and also um, on campus and some things that individuals can participate in 
The first is a, a team at the Bird Center. I'd like to give credit to Aaron Wilson and Jeff Dupre, who was a graduate student at the time, helped me working with the city and Morpsey, who's our regional planning authority to develop the climate change, Columbus Climate Adaptation Plan. Uh, this is the cover of that document. And if you'd like to peruse it, it's located at this web address located in the bottom of the slide. I think what was, when we, as we started to draft that document, one of the things we needed to do was make sure that this was written in a way that those that read it in city government, individuals with nonprofits and with businesses, and the average person had their first entry point to climate change information. And in fact, one of the chapters in that document focuses on extreme heat. And if you look at the actions that were recommended there, a number of them close, closely connect with the urban heat island. Um, one of them being response networks, cooling centers, and how we make sure we not just create facilities that are city owned, but think about what people will do during, during high heat events. They will get on the bus system, they'll go to their church, they'll go to a show in the theater, and all those things we then had to make sure we made county officials aware of last summer and this summer, because with the pandemic going on, a lot of those plans you put in place had to be altered. The other was going ahead and internalizing practices to address the urban heat island. And we'll see at the end of this, some of that's starting to pay dividends now a few years later. If anyone here does work in the public health arena, I would like to point out from the CDC, there's a BRACE framework that was created probably about six or seven years ago. It started to really take off. And this is a series of documents and guiding resources that allow those in the public health arena to think about climate change impacts holistically and not just your urban heat island, but how it will affect operations and the health of the community. Related to that, um, kind of a, a transition happened, and I'd like to give credit to Jim DeGrand, who I think is on this call. He's in the Department of Geography, who helped pioneer the installation of a series of sensors on campus. So we do have a Mesonet that's now located on the Ohio State University campus. The web address is located in the bottom of the slide. These stations are located throughout Ohio State with the placement dictated by a classification that was created by um, Young Yegel, who was a graduate student at OSU. The classification can be seen here in the bottom right. We went ahead and took the Stewart and Oak model, um, took a number of variables that fortunately are readily available for most large urban campuses because it's a GIS product. It gives a sky view factor, height of buildings, a lot of information on land use. We could go ahead and classify campus and then determine where to install these sensors. The other benefit is if anybody on this, on this event is trying to install sensors for other reasons, you can approach us and we can go ahead and co-locate those stations, which means hardware is already available. And in some cases, there might be an ability to help co-collect data. Uh, so these are some of the pictures of that installation happening. You'll see, um, if you go to the Mesonet, there's a map that located, locates where all of those are. Um, Randall is helping install the sensor here. This one was located on the fifth, number five parking lot on the West Campus. They're installed on, for the most part, on campus light posts. We did make some alterations to make sure they blended in better because that is something that campus is sensitive to. Uh, but these are relatively low cost sensor that has very few moving parts you have to worry about. You don't need any kind of additional data because it's provided with solar power. And then there's a logger in there to go ahead and, and take the data and stream it using the Verizon network. The other benefit to doing this is our team with the state climate office hopes a similar network could be installed around the state of Ohio. And these are some similar sensors that were installed out of Farm Science Review. So trying to learn on a smaller scale, some of the challenge we expect as we, we scale this up to a larger geographic area. And then some ongoing initiatives going on in Columbus. Um, I was excited to read the draft Columbus Urban Forestry Master Plan. This is currently available online and I would strongly encourage those of you to, to read it over. There's both a technical document that then informs the document that guides the city. Uh, Davy Tree Service went ahead and created that. Uh, I, I met with them a year and a half ago at a separate event and was really excited to see a lot of the cutting edge science was brought into that document. They talked holistically about some of the benefits to trees for both stormwater reduction, urban heat island, mental health, ecosystem services. But I think one of the things I'm most excited about with, uh, with climate resilience planning is to think about things that provide co-benefits. And the graphic on the bottom here is a picture of some of the green infrastructure Columbus decided to install to deal with stormwater. So instead of bearing pipes, these, these uh, stormwater systems or rain gardens were put in Clintonville that allowed the city to deal with that problem, allowed them to partner with the university to collect data, provided all these co-benefits, and is something which has the opportunity to provide a lot of additional value to the city. And I think this can be a great example of how thinking carefully about what we do could allow us to better understand it and better scale it. 
and ask questions of, does the performance on something like this really continue over the next 10 years to do what it was supposed to do? And um, I think is a great synergy of universities working with urban landscapes. So uh, David, you did inspire me with your talk to go back and look. I did put a reflective shingle on my house. I have a pretty old house when I installed them about seven years ago. So I wanna kind of go back and look at that now and see if maybe I can decide to instrument it. And I would to give, like to give a call out to Kira because I remember one of the first talks I had heard when I started at Ohio State that connected the urban, urban heat island with people was a talk by Aaron Kleinenberg about the 1995 heat wave in Chicago. And I think his book laid out a really in-depth view of how all these things connected. Um, so our work we did with the city definitely was informed by, by participating in that seminar. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, that was um, a great discussion as well. So um, at this point, we're going to uh, go over the questions that were posed by our audience. And uh, we're going to have our panelists, uh, Harvey, Jason, as well as Professor Saylor here to um, you know, answer our questions. So the first question is for David. And um, if you know on top of your head, uh, what is the cost of achieving one degree of cooling for Phoenix? And how would that compare to the benefits that you mentioned in your talk? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And that is, you know, something that's obviously very important. Um, one answer to that is zero. Um, so if you think about the strategies that we're talking about, it's, uh, you know, re-roofing uh, rooftops. And, you know, your typical roof lasts 15 to 25 years, depending on whether it's residential or commercial and the incremental cost to go with a white roof versus a conventional roof, is, you know, a darker roof is, is nil. And so, so by implementing uh, either in, in, um, in building codes or in, in policies, uh, we, we could convert you know, a large fraction of the rooftops to highly reflective roofs. The, the technology that I talked about with, with the 3M material that's a little bit more expensive, but it's still not that expensive. Um, I have not done that calculation yet, but just looking at the existing, uh, the city of Phoenix said that their their cost of that that cool seal was was uh, was actually cost competitive with the traditional approach. And so, if you think about the natural cycle of, of resurfacing roads and and resurfacing rooftops, you could imagine this costing nothing and getting to the point where you'd have enough coverage with just conventional materials, conventional highly reflective materials, where you could get that, that one degree cooling. And, and this harkens back to my, you know, my PhD years ago was on cooling Los Angeles by making Los Angeles more white uh, and more reflective. And, and even you know, through the years, including a review article that just is getting published now with another colleague um, we're finding that that one degree cooling is very manageable with existing technologies. And so it's just a matter of, of getting the willpower to, to enforce regulations and, and incentives to, to implement these technologies. Okay, great. So the next question is uh, somewhat related to the first question. It's again uh, related to cooling and reflection of heat. So some researchers at OSU and elsewhere, they're looking at ways to integrate non-recycled plastics into concrete and asphalt. Do you have any sense on how this may affect the degree to which this material can reflect heat? Um, I'll, I'll take a first stab, but I don't know if Jason or Harvey have any additional input, but um, a lot of it depends upon sort of the, the solar reflectance of the aggregate that becomes exposed as, as paving ages. And so uh, I don't know if it inherently would, would make the surface more reflective. It would probably change the thermal property some, um, but um, I think it would depend upon the nature of how it's integrated. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, um, Jason, do you have something to say? No? No, I was just going to say, I suspect with some of those kind of products, the primary reason to do it is kind of a life cycle, getting rid of a waste product otherwise, or maybe changing the bonding properties and how strong it is. But it does beg the question with these is like, there are other ancillary costs or benefits that could be looked at holistically if you examine the product from a different angle. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think the next question is a question that's on uh, quite a few people's mind, given that we're all researchers and looking at projects and funding. So is the research work uh, with the city that you presented, is that funded by the city, a federal agency, or is it a combination by the university? How, how was that funded? So yeah, the projects that I talked about and others are really a mix of funding. So the county project was county funded through a mechanism where they, they bring resources to the university and then they have input into what we do with it. Um, the city was a grant directly from the city to us. Um, the, uh, the Tempe, the bus shelter one was 3M uh, donating materials and donating installation costs. And the, the city simply making their shelters available to us. And then we had an internal grant that was a foundation type grant. But we've, we've also partnered with cities where like they've gone after funding, like you know, Bloom, Bloomberg funding or, or you know, other federal agencies where we'll partner with them and we go in together. You know, you know, I think most researchers here are familiar with the very common approach of, of you know, getting stakeholders to, to send you those, those magic letters of you know, intent to collaborate for your NSF proposal. So, so we've got a lot of collaborations like that. We have one pending right now where we have 13 cities from the desert Southwest who are all on board, but we have proposed to NSF uh, to use the funding in a way that would actually put a lot of those resources directly into the city projects. So the cities would volunteer a little bit of time, but they would actually get hundreds of thousands of dollars of resources to deploy some of these types of technologies. So I think you know there, there are many different models. Okay. I can comment a little bit on that. Um, in Cura, we pursue NSF funding. We participate in other uh, type of federal funding, NSF, NIH. We also, um, a lot of times when we work with um, the community, the partners bring in-kind contributions, resources, time, staff people to the, to the project. And I, I think this is something, so ours is, it's a real heterogeneous mix. This is something that as a center director, I have to explain to my uh, leadership above me that not all the stuff we're doing is just NSF money coming through the Office of Sponsored Projects, that we are doing things through other, other channels. Of course, universities love NSF funding and other types of federal funding because of the overhead. But I think in the future for the type of work we're talking about, there's going to be more opportunities to get this type of support from community partners, from the private sector, and also from foundations. I think that's another uh, source of... Um, funding that we should, we should be tapping into, but it does mean you're gonna to have to educate your dean or whoever that yes, we're doing stuff that may not show up on your uh, spreadsheet, but th this is what's happening right now. I I've had that conversation recently. <laughs> I'm sure it was a fun conversation. <laughs> okay. It, it was a good one, but I'm just saying it, it's, it is a, you have to remind them. Okay. Um, so the next question is uh, related to the energy balance of the city. So for instance, if the, the electricity that is coming into a city to power the city, for example, for air conditioning, is that counted as a significant contributor to the energy balance of the city? Uh, yes, it can be. So um, that, that's an area that I've done a lot of work on in the past. I refer to it as anthropogenic waste heat. So basically uh, anytime you use energy in a city, uh, the vast, vast majority of that goes into waste heat that eventually makes it into the atmosphere as, as anthropogenic waste heat. And so it can be important. It's, it's especially important in the winter when in, in sort of northern climates, when it's a large quantity and the mixing heights are a little bit less. So it mixes into a thinner atmosphere, essentially near the surface. And you can, you can have waste heat be, you know, responsible for one degree Celsius perhaps in the winter uh, in places like Philadelphia um, where we've done some authoring work. But um, in a typical city like Phoenix, we're a little bit more spread out. So the concentration of that waste heat is not as much. And so it's not large compared with, you know, the so just doing a modest improvement to the solar reflectance of the city is much more effective be just because of the magnitude of the solar input. Okay. I think the next question uh, is again um, a question that would be on quite a few people's minds. Uh, given that the resources are limited and you talked about quite a few strategies, 
how do we best determine where to make the investments? Is it going to be cool paving, cool roofs, um, urban vegetation, which will have the best, um, highest return on investment hmm. in your opinion? Yeah, so it's, it's a mix. I, I think, you know, one thing, you know, when I was a grad student working in this field, it was just about modeling the entire city being, being coded with, with something that was highly reflective, right? And increasingly, we're starting to focus more on, like you, you mentioned the where, and, and you're, you were referring to which technologies, but there's also the where in terms of physically. So like you want to identify areas in the city that are particularly hot and where the residents are particularly vulnerable. So this typically is looking at in the intersection of extreme heat in the city with, with poverty, with, with the elderly and so forth. And so that can help you figure out where to target possibly. But then in terms of like return on investment for the technologies, uh, anything you do on a rooftop will benefit it has direct and indirect benefits. So it'll cool the, the building. It'll save the building owner energy for air conditioning. It'll also cool the urban environment. So that's kind of a double, you know, double win. So, and that's an easy thing to do. So I think that would be a high priority. Um, cool paving is a little bit more difficult to, to, to make the case for compared to cool roofing, just because of some of the shading issues and, and the, the uh, tree, you know, tree cover and, and so forth. Um, Urban vegetation um, is potentially very beneficial in ways beyond thermal environments, right? So, the, you know, vegetation can cool the environment, but it also can provide shade. But there's also a lot of sort of mental health benefits in terms of, of having access to, to natural vegetation. So I think you know that would be provided you can do it in in a uh, a water uh, you know, a, a, a water sensitive way, you know, urban vegetation makes a lot of sense. May I ask David a question, Gusha? Of course. I will, I'm wondering how much Phoenix uses it through a social equity lens. I mean, are they, are they concentrating these interventions, these shading interventions in more parts of the city where urban heating is, people are particularly vulnerable? Or is this something that's just being done everywhere or maybe just in the rich parts of the city. Just wondering how, how the city is approaching this problem. So the city of Phoenix, um, uh, so they are interested in targeting it a bit. So, you know, the, the big HUD grant I mentioned was for affordable housing and, you know, it's the largest concentration of affordable housing in the state. And it's, you know, it's the focus of, of extensive efforts to try to cool that neighborhood. And, you know, and part of it is, you know, if you just look for the neighborhoods that are the hottest, they, they tend to coincide with the ones that the are the poorest. And so there's the biggest opportunity to have a benefit for the biggest number of people. So they are doing that. And, and then they've got some ideas around cool corridors, which is also sort of a targeted strategy. So provide shading to get people from parks to neighborhoods or from neighborhoods to mass transit and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, I think in general, they are focused more on you know, through an, sort of an equity lens, but that's not always the case, right? I mean, oftentimes it's the people who can afford to plant and maintain trees that get the, the cooling benefits of them. Yeah, on a related note, I would like to say my former doctoral student did a study and she found that, you know, um, social equity is really a factor. So we, when we think about shades, when we think about urban heat island, um, your socioeconomic status really um, identifies uh, how much shade you're going to get, what will be the heat effects and so on. Okay, um, so I think we have time for um, two other questions. Um, so what would be the best strategy for monitoring the effects? Um, so we talked about these uh, different strategies, but what would be the best way to assess um, our investments and in our efforts, whether they're successful or not. Yeah, so I mean, one way I look at that question, and it, it's, it's something that it's very hard to me really measure, is you know, tie it to your, your overarching goals. You know, and your overarching goals, you know, and you know, I, every time the city of Los Angeles puts out their their, um, their plan to cool the city being sort of a reduction in heat island magnitude being the target, I, I just kind of shake my head because they don't really care about the heat island magnitude. What they care about are 
the health effects and the energy effects, you know, they, they care about the consequences of ex excess heat in the city. And so if, you're, if your concern is health or, or more mortality, tracking mortality, but that, that is a hard thing because it, it co-varies with so many other things like mental health resources for the community. You know, Phoenix has seen some of the highest death rates in years when we had more moderate summers, right? And it's, it's heat related deaths, but it's because we didn't have as much money going into homeless uh, support programs. So, so given that that's really hard to measure, um, I mean, you can do, you know, we've talked about the, you know, the, the mesonet you know, idea, um, you know, you can have networks of, of, of weather stations or, or systems where you gather near surface air temperatures over time and, and try to map how, how that thermal environment has changed. And it's not something that you're gonna easily see from one year to the next, it's gonna take time. Uh, but, but that would be one approach. And we do, like with a lot of our projects, we've established uh, long-term stations that are just gathering, you know, air temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, and that's it. And so we have, we, we don't have many of those, but we have some of those across the city. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for the discussion and answering our questions. This was a very engaging talk. Uh, it was very informative as well. Mm -hmm. And I also would like to thank our discussants uh, together with uh, Professor Saylor. Thanks for making the time uh, to uh, present as part of our seminar series. At this point, I'm going to leave the stage to uh, Stephen. Uh, he's going to talk about some of our ongoing efforts as the co-leads of the Smart and, Smart and Resilient Communities Program here at Sustainability Institute. Um, thanks everyone for your time and thanks for joining us. Go ahead, Stephen. Great. So just to wrap things up, you might be wondering, well, how can I get involved in all of this great work that's going on at Ohio State? Um, I have ideas. And so uh, Gusha and I, our job is to help build a community among researchers here at Ohio State that are interested in smart and resilient communities to help build research teams and, and research capacity uh, to catalyze large research proposals and to grow research in strategic areas. And so we encourage you, if you're not already, to become an SI affiliated faculty member. And you can um, find that uh, link off the SI website. Uh, we mentioned the student research opportunities. So if you're a student that is on this uh, webinar today, please check out the SI website, the applications are due March 12th. So um, that's coming up quickly. Uh, if you are involved or interested, you have ideas, you wanna get involved in collaborations with others at Ohio State, uh, we will be rolling out exploratory research groups. And so we're looking for participants and leaders uh, and ideas uh, to build around those. And also just to say that we're uh, meant to be a resource. So. If you have ideas for developing large research grants and you want support, um, SI can help and Gusha and I can help with identifying those resources and um, making your dream become reality. So with that, I just wanted to encourage folks to reach out and get involved. Some of you may have received emails from us uh, directly and we'll be meeting with you later this month. And we look forward to those conversations. And then finally, there's lots going on at uh, Ohio State. And one of those things is with our friends at Cura. Um, on March 12th, there is a Strong Towns with uh, Charles Marone, a Strengthening Legacy Cities event. So if you have interest in resilient urban communities, you may want to check out this event on March 12th uh, from 12 to 1. And that uh, registration is available on the Cura website. So with that, I will wrap things up and thank everyone for your participation today. And we look forward to future conversations around smart and resilient communities.